as we get ready to take a look here in John chapter 14, beginning at verse 15. Uh, you need to come with me to a certain time and place. The time is that it's the night before Jesus' crucifixion. The place is in an upper room somewhere in the city of Jerusalem. He's gathered there together with his disciples to have a Passover meal together all around a table. They've gone through the rituals of the Passover. He's instituted what we call the Lord's Supper. He's washed their feet. Judas has left. Jesus is opening up his heart to the disciples. And in the midst of that very warm, that very family feeling, kind of that very intimate scene all gathered together around the table, Jesus gives them some news that would be very hard for them to hear. The, the, the news that there was a traitor in their midst, that was hard for them to hear. But I think it was also hard for them to hear the fact that Jesus was going to leave them, that he was departing. And, and it was in the heart of Jesus not to just leave them out in the cold, but to pour into them as much as he could these last few hours that Jesus had to speak with his disciples before his crucifixion, that's the context when we pick it up here at verse 15 when he says to them, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Notice how Jesus begins this little section, verse 15. He makes a very simple but a very profound statement. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now just in the previous verses, he gave them a marvelous open door and privilege of prayer. He said, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. And that's a pretty big promise, don't you think? But in the midst of such a great promise that Jesus gave to his disciples, he also wanted to be very careful to teach them about the importance of obedience, about doing what Jesus said to do. And so gathered around with him at that table, he looks at his disciples very close, man to man, face to face, eye to eye, and it says, hey, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's a pretty dramatic way to start off something, isn't it? If you love me. You know, think about that. It's a very awkward phrase. Think about a husband and wife saying that to it. If you love me, dot, dot, dot. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So what did he have in mind when he said commandments? Well, I, I think it's a comprehensive statement. Jesus had just taught them for three years. They understood something of what Jesus commanded. But just earlier that evening, Jesus had commanded them three things. And I think those are the things that Jesus had most in mind. What did he have most in mind? He commanded them, as I have washed your feet, so wash one another's feet. Do humble acts of service to one another. That's what I command you. If you love me, do that. He commanded them to love one another as he had loved them. He said, listen, if you love me, this is how I want you to treat one another. You treat one another the way that I treat you. And thirdly, he said that he commanded them to put their faith in the Father and in Jesus himself. Hey, if you love me, trust me, believe me. And so he's telling them, if you really love me, you'll do this. And friends, this is what I want you to understand. I want you to understand that it's important for us as followers of Jesus Christ to understand there is a vital aspect of obedience in our following him. There are people that we meet in the Christian world today that they profess to be Christians. They'll tell you about their love for Jesus, but their attitude is something like this. They say, um, I, I, I really love Jesus. I just don't like him telling me how to live. Friends, don't you agree that that's not the right way to approach following Jesus Christ? Don't say, I really love Jesus. I just don't want him to tell me how to live. Don't say that. I, I, I fear that sometimes you can have an atmosphere where people just, this is a picture I have in mind, somebody really worshiping God, they're just sort of lost in this rapture of worship, and oh, I love you, Lord, I love you, and then they go out, and the other six days a week, they live a lifestyle that's very demonstrated disobedience to God. Th there's something wrong there. If you love him, keep his commandments. That's something I need to hear. I think it's something that you probably need to hear as well. You see, I need to know that when I fail in my obedience, 
it's not just a problem of me not trying hard enough. It's not just a problem of me needing more self-will and willpower to overcome these things. It's not necessarily a problem of having not enough information. Oh, if I only knew better techniques. No, somewhere along the line, my failure to obey is connected to a failure to love Jesus as I should. If I really loved him more, I'd obey him better. Now, I, I can imagine somebody hears this and they go, Man, I must not love Jesus at all based on this last week. You think about all the ways you disobeyed him. And okay, I get that. If you want to obey him more, you need to love him more. But how do you love him more? I'll tell you how you love Jesus more. This is the really good news. I'll start the verse and you guys finish it. Ready for this? We love him because... Okay, that's good. The first service was a little better. I'm going to be straight with you guys. In 1 John, and is it interesting that John the Apostle wrote this as well? We love him because he first loved us. Do you know how to grow in your love for Jesus? You, you don't lock yourself in the room and say, gotta love more, gotta love more, gotta love more. If you wanna love Jesus more, put your heart and your meditation on the greatness of his love for you. Consider how great his love is to you. You will respond naturally with a love towards him. And out of that natural response of love towards him, you'll find yourself obeying his commandments more and more. That's how we love him more and obey him more. But this is the other thing I want to see. In verse 16, Jesus says, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper. You see, this is the second in a series of three assurances that Jesus gave to his disciples. The first of the series of three we saw last week. The first assurance was, hey, listen guys, um, your job isn't ended when I leave you. You're going to keep on doing the work and I'll show you how. Now the second assurance is found right here in verse 16. The disciples were afraid Jesus is abandoning us. When he leaves us, we won't know what to do. And Jesus, no, you'll know what to do. Because when I leave you and when I ascend to heaven, I'm going to ask the Father and the Father is going to send forth the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will be a helper to you. He's going to be the one who helps you when I am no longer physically present to help you. Friends, Jesus understood that the disciples, and I mean the 11 people sitting around that table that night, and you and I as well, that the disciples of Jesus need God's presence and power to follow him the way that we should. Do you understand that? You can't do it on your own. You need God to work in you and through you to live the way that he wants you to live. And so God says, I'll do this for you. I will send forth the Holy Spirit and he will be in your life a helper that will help you to do the life that I have lived, caused you to live. I mean, verse 16, he says that he will give you another helper. Now that word in the original language, the ancient Greek language that we translate helper, it's kind of a complicated word. It, it means something like this. It means someone who's called alongside to help. It could mean someone who just gives comfort. It could mean someone who's like an attorney or an advocate. It could mean an intercessor. It could mean a mediator. But what it means is someone who comes alongside at that critical moment and gives the help that the person needs. Jesus says, the Holy Spirit will be that for you. I will send you another helper. And if I could just get a little bit more into the original language... When Jesus says, I'll send you another helper, he used a very specific word in the ancient Greek language. When he said another, he used a specific ancient Greek word that means another of the same kind. You see, in the ancient Greek, they had a pretty sophisticated vocabulary. And in their sophisticated vocabulary, they had two different words for another. I think it's kind of helpful, actually. One word for another meant another of a different kind. The other word for another meant another of the same kind. When Jesus says another helper's coming, he's saying another of the same kind. Now, what was the first kind? Jesus was the first helper. He says, I'm the first helper. I'm departing to heaven. But don't worry, when I go up to heaven, the Father will send down from heaven the helper to fill your life and to bring you what you need. And friends, how great would it be 
to live the Christian life with Jesus physically beside you in his bodily form every day that you lived your Christian life. Wouldn't that be great? Jesus, what do you want me to do today? And you just talk it over with Jesus. Uh, Jesus, should I do that? No, you just talk it over with Jesus and he tells you. Uh, Jesus, would you help me in this? You talk it over with Jesus. You're feeling really tempted? Jesus, would you pray for me? Jesus prays for you. You go, what a great help that would be in my Christian life. Friends, do you understand? God sent a helper, the Holy Spirit. That is exactly the role that the Holy Spirit is intended to fill. That is exactly how the disciples gathered around the table at the Last Supper understood it. That's exactly how Jesus wants us to understand it. He sends the Holy Spirit to be our helper, verse 16, that he may abide with you forever. Now please notice this. He says, he, that he may abide with you forever because the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not an impersonal force. I always think when I speak about something like this, I think, what would it be like if someone is here this morning and they've never been to church before, they have no familiarity with what the Bible says? I could see that if that was you this morning, you'd think I'm kind of strange with what I'm talking about. What are you talking about? I get this guy, Jesus. I've seen some of the movies. Okay, I get that guy. God the Father in heaven. All right, yeah, something like that. Holy Spirit, what is that? Friends, let me just explain it very succinctly. The Bible tells us that there are three persons in one God. We believe in one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. However, there's one God in three persons. A person known as God the Father, a person known as God the Son, and a person known as God the Holy Spirit. Spirit means that he is immaterial. He has no bodily form. But something doesn't have to have a bodily form to be real. And the Holy Spirit is real. He's a real person. He has a mind. He has a will. He has emotions. He can be grieved. He can be honored. The Holy Spirit is real. He is a person. And he is the aspect of God that fills and works in and among believers. When Jesus was no longer physically present with his disciples, he sent the Holy Spirit to be in them and with them and to be even better than Jesus. Better than Jesus? How could that be? Because, friends, the best you could have with Jesus' bodily presence is to have Jesus beside you. Jesus says, I'm going to do one better than that. I'm going to put the Holy Spirit in you. He'll be even in you. And that'll be an even greater experience than having Jesus beside you. Now, notice what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit, verse 17. Whom the world cannot receive. The world, and in the sense that Jesus means it here, he means the culture that is opposed to Jesus. I don't believe that all the culture is opposed to Jesus, but let's not deny it. There is a significant aspect of our culture that is opposed to Jesus. That aspect of the culture, the world, cannot receive the Holy Spirit. They don't want the spirit of truth because they're into lies. They don't want the Holy Spirit because they're more in tune with unclean spirits. Do you get the point here? The world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. Then, friends, this brings to us a very challenging truth. When a church tries to be like the world, the church cannot receive the Spirit. Jesus' church cannot be afraid to be different than the world. And, and it's a difficult line for us to walk. Sometimes Christians have tried to demonstrate that they're different from the world by dressing funny. And please, I hope nobody... If there's any Amish people in our midst, I apologize for this illustration. But listen, the, the Amish have had a certain approach to this, have they not? They dress in a certain way, no cars, on and on, all these things, because they want to scream out, we're different from the world. Well, yeah, you're different, but it's also weird. So weird they're making reality television programs about you and all. Now, we agree that yes, believers must be different from the world. 
but, but it's not as easy to say, well, that means we're going to dress different and drive different cars or we're going to drive horse and buggy instead of cars, on and on. All I can say is that we need to have a passion together as a community of Jesus Christ that we're not going to let the world set our agenda. That we're not going to seek to be liked by the world or that this is our highest priority. Because friends, the more we become like the world, the less we can receive the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus also said this in verse 17. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Friends, this is amazing. Jesus said three things about the Holy Spirit right there that I think you and I really need to grab a hold of. Number one, in contrast to the world, the disciples of Jesus should know the Holy Spirit. Do you know the Holy Spirit? Or, or for you, is the only aspect of God that you think about God the Father and God the Son? Do you even think about God the Holy Spirit? I think that the Holy Spirit is dishonored when we never acknowledge him, when we act as if we don't know him. So he said, first of all, a disciple should know the Holy Spirit. Secondly, in contrast to the world, the disciples should have the Holy Spirit with them. He said, you shall know him for he dwells with you. Notice, the Holy Spirit should be with you in everything that you do in your life. But then thirdly, he said, in contrast to the world, the disciple of Jesus should have the Holy Spirit in them. Not just on the outside looking in, but in them. Now, there's two prepositions used there, with and in. Jesus added a third preposition in the book of Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when he said that the Holy Spirit would be upon them. And that's a whole other thing and interesting to talk about, but I can't get into it right now. Let me just say it this way. Dear, dear believer in Jesus Christ, do you know what it is to have the Holy Spirit in you? Do you know what it is to have the Holy Spirit fill your life? Have you consciously yielded to and asked for the filling of God's Holy Spirit? Because you can't live the Christian life the way God wants you to without it. This is a necessary thing for every believer. And I don't have any, any doubt that there's a lot of people who are in fear. There are a lot of people who are in anxiety. There are a lot of people who are yielding to temptation. There are a lot of people who are weak. There are a lot of people who are afflicted in many, many different ways simply because they don't know the Holy Spirit. They're not conscious of the Holy Spirit with them. And they're certainly not conscious of the Holy Spirit in them. And this is something that Jesus offers to every disciple, to every one of us. We need to receive it and we need to believe it. More on that later, but let's look now at verse 18. Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you a little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. At that day, you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Notice how Jesus begins this little section. In verse 18, he says, I won't leave you orphans. Yes, I'm leaving you. I'm going to ascend out heaven. But I will not leave you orphans. I will leave you with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And when the Spirit does his work, notice verse 20, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me and I in you. Through the Holy Spirit, they would know a life of relationship with God, of shared life with God, of union with God the Father and God the Son through the work of God the Holy Spirit. They would know what it's like to live with God, with personal connection with God. Do you know what that's like? Do you know what it's like to really live with a personal connection with God through Jesus Christ. Now, again, I think about how this would sound in the ears of someone who doesn't know Jesus at all. I've had this conversation with people and it's very interesting. They're usually not this honest, but let me tell you what it would be like if they were totally honest, if you know they could just open up their heart. I say, wow, did you know that you could have a personal relationship with God? That Jesus Christ has made it possible for you to really personally connect to God on a very close level? And if people were very honest, sometimes they would respond like this. They would say, Mr., I've been spending my whole life running away from God. Why would I ever want him to catch up to me? 
you know, a personal relationship with God is not desired by everybody. But it should be. Now, I understand. God can sometimes be scary. But the part of me that finds God scary and a personal relationship with him not so great, that's a part of me that's not good. That's a part of me that I need to lay down and surrender before God and just say, God, I need you. You made me to connect with you. That's how you designed me. There's a God in heaven who made me, and he made me to relate to him, and I will only find out who I am. I will only find out what I'm here on this earth for as I find out my relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And this is what God makes open for us through the work of Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, with verse 22, we have one of the disciples raising a question. Look at the question he asks. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord... How is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him, and we will come into him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. Judas, not Iscariot, but the other Judas, He asked Jesus what I think is a pretty good question. He said, Jesus, I can't figure out. You said that we will see and perceive you, but not the rest of the world. Now, John doesn't record it, but earlier, Matthew records it in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew records that Jesus had just recently taught the disciples that there would come a day when every eye would see him. Everyone on the earth would know that Jesus was there. He goes, Jesus, I can't understand. You just told me that everybody's going to see you. Now you're saying only we are going to see you? What do you mean by this? And Jesus responds in verse 22 by saying, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Jesus is essentially repeating the themes from the previous verses. I'm going to be revealed to the disciples and among the disciples by the love, by the obedience, by the union that you have with the Father and the Son. I'm not talking primarily about mystical or ecstatic experiences. I'm talking about the real God coming into my life and living in a real way and in a personal way. Notice what Jesus said. He said, if anyone loves me, it's a love for Jesus. Jesus, I love you. I I just don't love the stuff that you give. I just don't love the truth. I just don't love a noble, righteous card. No, Jesus, I love you, Jesus. And this is what he communicates to us. It's a personal love, but it's also a love for what Jesus has said in his word. Notice what he says. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Boy, this verse really came to me in a powerful way this week. I read an article on the internet about a guy, and uh, to tell you the truth, I, I don't remember the guy's name. I could look it up. But it's a guy who says, listen, I am a Christian. I love Jesus. I'm a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, but I'm a practicing homosexual. And so, you know, I, I make no apology. I make no repentance for the conduct of my life in this. I think Jesus thinks it's just fine. And, and so he's explaining how he comes to this idea biblically. And this is what he says. He goes, listen, I'll admit the Bible condemns homosexual practice. He says, I'll admit this. And he says, I'll also admit that Jesus says homosexual practice is wrong. I'll admit it. But this is what we got to understand, that Jesus was wrong about these things. And he says, Jesus was wrong about a lot of things. And then he lists several things that he thinks. If Jesus was wrong about a lot of things, this is just another thing that Jesus is wrong about. And Christians kind of need to get over it and just move on and say, okay, I can be a Christian and recognize that Jesus is wrong about some things. May I just read this verse? If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. I wish I could sit down with that man over a cup of coffee. And I wish I could talk to him very tenderly and very warmly about a lot of things. But what I'd want to say as much as anything, say, dear friend, dear friend, if you think you really love Jesus the way that you claim to, you would 
honor his word. You'd want, to com- you'd want to keep his word. You wouldn't set yourself as a higher authority over his word and say, well, I'll let you know which words of Jesus were wrong and which ones are right. By the way, that's a lot of power, don't you think? It, you, you say that you love Jesus, but according to Jesus' own definition, if you really loved him, you would look at what he says and he goes, I want to keep that. I want to value that. I want to affirm what Jesus says. And as difficult it may be with whatever temptations or whatever inclinations lie in my wicked heart or your wicked heart, we say, no, we want to let Jesus and his word reign supreme. If I love him, I want to keep his word. Now going on to verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said you. Uh, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Oh, the first thing I want you to notice here in this section that I just read is in verse 26, Jesus said that God the Father would send the Helper. He said the Helper whom the Father will send in my name. Did you see that phrase in verse 26? The Holy Spirit, the helper, would be sent by the Father in the name of Jesus. Now, what does that mean, to send it in the name of Jesus? Last week, we talked about what it meant to pray in the name of Jesus. I don't know if any of you remember that. When we talk about what it meant to pray in the name of Jesus, we said it meant two main things. Number one, it meant to pray according to the merits of Jesus. I'm not coming in my own merits, I'm coming in the merits of Jesus. But number two, we said that it meant to pray according to the nature and the character and the will of Jesus, to pray for something as Jesus would pray. Don't you see it means the same thing here when it says that the Father would send the Spirit in the name of the Son? Here's the first thing. He sends the Holy Spirit in the merits of Jesus, not in my merits or your merits. I imagine a person thinking something like this. Oh, this gift of the Holy Spirit sounds so wonderful. I need this gift of the Holy Spirit. Here's the problem. I'm not worthy. I think of how I lived my life this last week. I'm really not worthy. I'm not worthy to receive this gift of the Spirit. I've got good news for you. You don't need to be worthy. He's not sent in your name. He's sent in the name of Jesus. If Jesus is worthy, then you who trust in him can ask for this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, I'm more worried about those of you who think that you are worthy for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those are the ones that we got to have a little talk about. He's given in the merits of Jesus, not in our own merits, but he's also given according to the nature and the character of Jesus. In other words, the Holy Spirit will work as Jesus worked. He works along the same lines. He works to continue the work of Jesus. He doesn't work to do a different work or a crazy work. And I think this is an important point. Because friends, if you look about the landscape of Christianity in the year 2015, there is a lot of crazy stuff out there. There's stuff out there that you just, you just go, what? They think this is in the name of Jesus? They think that the Holy Spirit's doing this? Friends, you better watch out about blaming your crazy stuff on the Holy Spirit. Because if it's not the kind of thing that Jesus did, don't say that the Holy Spirit would do it. Because he came in Jesus' name. I'll just read it to you again. The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name... Verse 26, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. He continues the work of Jesus. He doesn't do a different work. But then Jesus said to them, verse 27, peace I leave to you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And wouldn't you love to have some peace in your life? Jesus, at that table, spoke to his disciples, and he says, peace I give to you. Now, in the one sense, that was such almost a boring thing for Jesus to say. How could it be boring? 
Friends, that was the common way to say goodbye and hello in that culture. Shalom. It's like aloha. You know, it's both hello and goodbye. Shalom, you say when you greet somebody. Shalom, you say when you're leaving them. Hello and goodbye in the same word. You, you bestow peace upon them. You bestow God's shalom upon them. That was a common way of doing that. Nothing unusual that. But Jesus says, I'm not saying that the way that the world says it. The world just says it. It's just a word. It's just see ya. Jesus says, no, it's not like that at all. I mean this. Do, do you know what the English word goodbye actually means? Where it comes from? It's a contraction from older English means, meaning God be with you. Every time you say goodbye to somebody, literally, you're saying God be with you. Isn't that a way, great way to say goodbye to somebody? But we never think of it that way. To us, it's just goodbye. Well, it's the same way with the way they would just say peace when they would leave somebody. Jesus, I don't mean it in that empty way. I mean it with all my heart. I want my peace to be upon you. Whose peace? Jesus' peace. I'll ask you a question. If you had a choice between the peace of Jesus to fill your life and the peace of David Guzik to fill your life, which peace would you take? <laughs> now, I can say without reservation, the peace of David Guzik would be a big step up for some of you. <laughs> oh, I'm serious. Well, because, because you're more tormented by anxiety and stress and difficulty than even I am. So, I mean, look, I, I've got struggles just like any of you do. And, and I need the peace of God to fill my life. But some of you, you're really stressed out. You're really filled with anxiety. You're really filled with fear. So, so even whatever peace I have, it would be an improvement. But you don't have to settle for my peace. No, no, no. Jesus says, you think about what an amazing statement this is? Jesus said, you could have his peace. How much peace did Jesus have? Jesus had so much peace that it's the night before his crucifixion. He knows what is waiting for him in just a few hours. He has so much peace that on the night before his crucifixion, he could care about others and not care about himself. Let me tell you what I would be doing on the night before something like that. I'd be saying, leave me all alone. I just need some time to myself. Jesus is pouring in to love and prepare his disciples to the end. Why? Because he had peace. He had peace with the cross right in front of him, and he was filled with peace. You can have that same peace. Could you do that? Could you just go to God and say, God, would you please fill me with that peace? I need it. Moving on now, verse 28. You have heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you, if you loved me, you'd rejoice because I said, I'm going to my father, for my father's greater than I. And now I've told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. <laughs> Guys, I'm leaving and I know you're sad, but if you really knew how great it was for me to be going, you'd be happy for me. And if you really knew how great it would be for you when I pour out the Holy Spirit, you'd be happy. So rejoice. I know you're sad because I'm leaving, but rejoice. This is part of my peace that I give to you. And then he says in verse 30, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. They had been sitting or kind of reclining all around a table. Jesus says, okay, guys, let's get up and go. We've got to go to the Garden of Gethsemane because Judas is going to meet us there with an arresting army of soldiers. Now, you know what's funny about this? They stand around and talk for another three chapters. Isn't that just the way people are a lot of times? They have a hard time saying goodbye. And so they stand around and talk for another three chapters. Jesus has more to pour out in his heart about them. It's not going to be a quick goodbye. It's going to be a long goodbye. But at least now they're standing up at the table and they're standing around. And this, the rest of it, is going to be on their feet that Jesus speaks to them. But what did he say to them in these last few verses of, verse, of chapter 14? The ruler of this world is coming. Friends, Jesus knew that Satan was coming for him. 
I know it. I don't delude myself. Satan is coming for me, but this is what I know. He has nothing in me. I, I want that to be true for every one of us. That, G, that Jesus so fills our life that Satan has nothing in us. No a foothold, no place that is given to the devil, no a stronghold of deception, no, no body of lies that is tightly held on to and that is ruled over us perhaps for years. The fondest wish of my heart is that Jesus would so fill our lives that we could all say that Satan has nothing in us as well. But notice what else he says finally. He says that the world may know that the love I have for the Father and that the Father gave me commandments, so do I. I'm not being driven to the cross by Satan, even though he's coming for me. I'm going to the cross out of love and the world is gonna see it. We have to stop here. There's something in me that just wishes we could keep on going through these next three chapters, but we're gonna pause here. May I conclude with a final exhortation here? I wanna go back to what Jesus said about the sending of the helper and the Holy Spirit. Do you know that you need the Holy Spirit to fill your life? If you do, I'm gonna give us a moment to pray about it in just a moment, to pray that the Holy Spirit would fill our life. Now, if you don't know that the Holy Spirit really needs to fill your life, and look, I just want you to be honest about it. If you don't really have any sense of this, that's fine. Be honest about it. Don't, don't try to pretend you have a spiritual desire when you don't. If you know, I need the Holy Spirit, great, we'll pray about it for a moment. If you don't know it, you go, well, I don't know. I, maybe I do, maybe I don't. I don't really know. Then I want you to pray as well. But I want you to pray and ask God to show you your need for the Spirit. Not to pretend you have one when you don't, but to show you your need for the Spirit. And I want to do it in a different way. I'm going to pray right now, and then I'm just going to give it to be quiet for a moment in here. And in that quiet moment, I want you to pray between you and God. It's even okay with me if you pray with your voice. Just make it quiet. You're not praying to the whole room. You're just praying you and God. But if you want to pray out loud, fine. Just do it in a quiet voice. But friends, let's just come before the Lord, each individual heart, and say, fill me with your Holy Spirit or show me I have the need because there's something here I need. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for this promise given to us in your word that you would send a helper. And Lord, we need help. There's no other way to describe it, Lord. We need help. And it needs to be divine help. And it needs to be help in us, upon us. Lord, I can think of no greater need for this congregation than to have this filling of the Holy Spirit, this walk in the Spirit, this life in the Spirit. And Lord, we don't have any technology to lay hold of it other than to simply ask to pray. So we want to do that, Lord. And I pray that you'd inspire each individual heart right now in this moment of silence to ask you for the gift of the Holy Spirit all over again or to ask us to long for it in a way we never have before. Let's quietly pray before God right now. Lord, we don't have a technology 
to lay hold of the Spirit. We don't have a better internet connection. We don't have a sharper video resolution. We don't have a better sound system to do it. But you invited us to pray. So Lord, we recognize our need and we simply say, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Do it in our midst, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name.